good afternoon, good day, good evening, hello, wherever you are in the world. And I'm sure that many of you, like me, are watching this at home. Um, my name is Julian Tett. I'm the chair of the US editorial board at the Financial Times. I'm also co-founder of the Financial Times More Money Initiative, which covers sustainability and the sustainable development goals. And I am just delighted to be moderating today's event, which is called From Page to Action, Accountability for the Furthest Left Behind in COVID-19 and Beyond, which is a day before the ministerial segment of the High Level Political Forum to talk about these issues. We have some fantastic lineup of speakers to talk about these issues, which we'll be hearing from later on. And of course, we're talking at a pretty momentous point because we're 10 years after the founding of the Every Woman, Every Child initiative. We're five years after the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, this year has been turned upside down by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have also a big report of from 2020 from the Independent Accountability Panel for Every Woman, Every Child that really is providing the framing for what we're going to be talking about today. So let me start by thanking the governments of Japan, South Africa and Georgia for co-hosting this event and for their commitment and leadership to the initiatives and also the IAP, Every Woman, Every Child, the UNHC 2030 and PMNHCH for co-organizing this event. Now, COVID-19 has dominated the agenda this year. And at the beginning of the pandemic, there was quite a lot of discussion amongst journalists like myself of how this was supposed to be the Great Leveller event. Well, I think we've realized now that, that in many ways is absolute rubbish because the burden of this crisis, of this global tragedy, has fallen disproportionately on the poorest around the world. Now, we've seen that in countries which are supposedly developed and advanced, like America, where it's been overwhelmingly the African-American community and other minorities and the poorest segments who have suffered. But that is simply one small tip of an iceberg for the pain and the suffering and the challenges now being felt around the world by many of the world's poorest. And just to give you some examples, um, even before, and I'm reading off some points which have been given to me by the, the organizers, even before COVID-19, they tell me, global progress towards the 2030 targets to save the lives of women and children was already lagging by 20%. In some countries, there are the 50% in service coverage between the rich and poorest. Now, the crucial point and the crucial tragedy is that the poorest risk falling even further behind. Even as women represent 70% of the faces fighting COVID-19 on the front lines. Looking ahead, and given how hard this virus has hit the wealthy countries, we know that building systems that can count, serve and support everyone is not merely a question of resources, because resources are going to be constrained and challenged. It really is right now about political will, evidence-based action and constant learning and accountability at the heart of that process to build back better. And in a sense, a recognition that we're all linked in a global chain of humanity. And when the weakest link breaks, the chain as a whole suffers. So we're gonna talk about today's program and we're gonna have some a series of fantastic recommendations from a, the groundbreaking report of the independent accountability panel of every woman every child we're gonna have a conversation about what it actually means and we're gonna have a poll to try and bring in you the audience to ask you what you think is going on but before we start two quick things we have a hashtag that you can use to follow along on social media which is hashtag IAP 2020 and most importantly we have a fantastic speaker to kick us off with a discussion which is His Excellency Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, President of South Africa, Chairman of the African Union. And it's my very great honor to welcome him to talk first and to give him the floor, Your Excellency. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event, which addresses some of the most important issues facing humanity today. The coronavirus pandemic is testing the social, 
economic and political resilience of many countries and people around the world, but more importantly, developing countries. Many of these countries, especially African countries, already face challenges of extreme poverty, a lack of basic infrastructure and services, inadequate social protection systems, poor healthcare capacity and pre-existing disease burdens. The pandemic is placing an additional burden on already constrained health systems. This global crisis has starkly highlighted the value of universal health coverage in responding to health emergencies and the need for robust health systems to save lives. South Africa fully supports the efforts of the World Health Organization to ensure that there is universal health coverage across the world. The reality that we must now confront is that the response to COVID-19 crisis has required countries to reprioritize the allocation of their resources by diverting crucial technical and financial resources from other critical areas. The health of women has been severely impacted through this reallocation particularly in sexual and reproductive health services. There is a real danger that this will contribute to a rise in maternal and newborn mortalities, increased unmet need for contraception, and an unprecedented number of unsafe abortions and sexually transmitted infections. South Africa believes sexual and reproductive health services are crucial for a thriving society, including access to maternal health care and interventions related to gender-based violence. As countries of the world, we must ensure this pandemic does not worsen existing inequalities in society or impede the realization of the rights of women and girls. We must ensure that our response enables young people, in particular, to shape the world that will emerge from this crisis. It is significant that 65 out of the 168 Sustainable Development Goal targets refer to young people explicitly or implicitly with a focus on their empowerment, their participation, and indeed their well-being. It is our desire that developing countries should have equitable access to safe, and effective medicines and new health technologies as well. We call on the world to undertake the actions that are urgently needed to ensure collaboration on the development of knowledge, intellectual property and data for existing and new therapeutics, vaccines and diagnostics for COVID-19. I would like to commend governments around the world for their collaborative efforts towards advancing Sustainable Development Goal 3 on ensuring health and well-being for all. This includes a bold commitment to end HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and other communicable diseases by 2030. Fighting this global pandemic requires all of us to work together in collaboration with the United Nations as a united force. Indeed, we are stronger when we work together. I wish this meeting success with its deliberations. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed, His Excellency, for your comments, for your call to arms, and also for your leadership in this area. And now I'd like to call on Mr. Shinchi Kataoko, who is the president of the Japan International Cooperation Agency. Japan, like South Africa, is a co-leader of this initiative to say a few words. Thank you, Jivian, for your very kind introduction. COVID-19 has caused unprecedented damage on people's health and their activities. The pandemic has exposed social protection weaknesses in even the richest countries. It also has had disproportionate impacts on the most vulnerable and those poorest in developing countries. 
Japan so far has managed to keep COVID-19 per capita fatalities and infections among the lowest in the world. However, we must now prepare for second and third wave infections. Nobody will be safe until everyone is safe. In order to contain COVID-19, we must realize a world where everyone can live in dignity. This is what Japan is pursuing under the concept of human security. We need both prevention and treatment to control infectious diseases. Japan has long contributed to efforts for medical treatments. In the early 20th century, Dr. Noguchi Hideo, a Japanese scientist, worked hard to find the major causes of disease transmission. In his name, Ghana established the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research with Japan's cooperation. This institute is now not only conducting 80% of、uh, Ghana's PCR testing of、uh, Dianogs,、uh, COVID-19, but also training laboratory technicians in West Africa. Prevention is far more important than treatment. Washing hands is a simple and most effective solution to prevent infectious diseases. In Madagascar, the Minister of Water, Hygiene and Sanitation, who used to be a colleague of JICA, has promoted the hand washing song written by a popular local singer and a JICA volunteer. Additionally, JICA has worked to introduce the Maternal and Child Health Handbook in around 50 countries. This home based health record that originated in Japan. Seeks to protect the health of mothers and children. Furthermore, JICA is planning to launch a new initiative with an aim to establish resilient health and medical systems throughout the world. Details will be revealed soon. I believe this shows our commitment to promote universal health coverage or UHC. Let us strengthen our partnerships. And efforts to protect people's health and lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Kataoka. And it's great to hear about what Japan is doing in this respect、um, and the degree to which people are trying to learn lessons across borders, even harnessing pop songs for this.、Um, We're going to hear now from Ms. Joy Pumahi, who is a co chair of the Independent Accountability Panel for EWEC,、um, who is, of course, overseeing the launch of the report that this meeting is essentially celebrating, championing, and publicizing and taking action points from. So, Mr. Pumahi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gillen. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests. The IEP's 2020 report distills lessons from a decade of every woman, every child accountability. It reviews progress on the implementation of the global strategy and shows where the remedy and action are needed. COVID 19 has demonstrated the centrality of health to social, political, and economic imperatives. Before COVID, Progress towards 2030 targets to save the lives of women, children, and adolescents was already lagging by 20%. Inefficiencies from not making evidence based investments and corruption meant that 20 to 40% of health expenditures globally were being wasted. The pandemic is making the situation far worse, and effects on women, children, and adolescents are huge. There have been shutdowns of sexual and reproductive health services and attempts to push through retrogressive laws. With mass immunization campaigns being stopped, 13.5 million children were left unprotected against life threatening diseases. With school closures, 370 million children are missing out on school meals, and adolescents are suffering from social isolation and mental health issues. Predictions for the future paint an even grimmer picture. We could see a big rise in deaths among pregnant women and young children by 10 up to 50%, and disruptions in essential services and supplies. 
for every three months of lockdown, 15 million more cases of gender-based violence are anticipated. An estimated 42 to 66 million people have been pushed into extreme poverty with women, children and adolescents disproportionately affected and lacking social and financial protection. All of this shows why we as a global community must uncover the means to protect women, children and adolescents, not just during this pandemic, but up to 2030 and beyond. We do indeed need a decade of action, as the Secretary General has called for. So, how do we do that? How should world leaders respond? The key is accountability. I know how accountability can change people's lives materially. It is a catalyst for transforming commitments into progress and directing a spotlight on inequalities and racial and ethnic discrimination and those left behind not just in our response to COVID-19, but way beyond it. In practice, accountability means that world leaders, including heads of state, must fulfill their commitments to universal health coverage, primary health care, and international health regulations. The IAP report sets out an accountability framework with four pillars, commit, justify, implement, and progress. Our report gives three main recommendations as to how countries can build on these pillars. First, governments should invest in data systems. They must ensure, for example, that births and deaths are registered. They must monitor the quality and equity of service coverage. Next, accountability must be institutionalized with a formal relationship between, on the one hand, monitoring, review and recommendation, and on the other, remedy and action. Finally, accountability must be democratized so that the voices of people and communities are heard and acted upon and are at the center of delivery. Yes, similar recommendations have been made before. What will make the difference now is the collective realization catalyzed by COVID-19 that accountability is a must-have, not a nice-to-have. It must be embedded so that every leader and government is obliged to do what they say they will, with citizens fully able to participate and to claim their rights. When commitments are translated into progress and rights, only then will we live up to our promise to the world's women, children and adolescents. It is to them that we are all ultimately accountable. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Pumafi. Um, those are horrifying statistics. They're also fighting words. And I think they're a challenge for everyone who is watching. So what we're gonna do next is before we turn to the panel debate, we're gonna put a bit of democracy into action. And we want to hear from you about how accountable is your own organization or country, wherever you're watching this anywhere in the world. Um, many people aren't sure, which is why the Independent Accountability Panel has offered a checklist to help us frame these issues. And we're gonna crowdsource your answers online. It's a bit of an experiment, so I'm going to read out the instructions very slowly. So listen carefully. If you can't see the screen, go to menti.com on your smartphone, your tablet, wherever you are. Enter the code 909406 and submit your answers. I should stress the answers are anonymous. They're going to be tallied throughout the event and later shared on social media with the hashtag, hashtag AAP, oh, sorry, hashtag IAP2020 or simply stay with me and answer the questions right now. So make sure you've decided first before we even start this, are you gonna be answering this checklist on behalf of your country, where you're living or watching this, or on behalf of the organization that you work for? So just think about that for a moment. So the first question that it'll be great to hear your comments on, and remember they're collecting this information to try and inform policy and get more clarity and frankly more democracy. First question, has your organizational country gone on the record to commit to women's, children's and adolescents health and clearly identified who is responsible for putting specific commitments into action? Where does the buck stop, if you like? 
yes partially or no please vote second question does your country or organization make decisions and actions that are clearly justified by evidence rights and the rule of law again yes partially or no third question does your country or organization regularly monitor and review data and as Ms. Pumapi said then have that formal link back to enacting remedies and actually taking action fourth question on the issue of progress, does your organizational country continuously make tangible progress with all available resources towards clearly agreed goals? Now, if you answered yes to all of those questions, that's obviously fantastic. Um, frankly, it makes this report and meeting pretty useless, um, or not useless, but you know, less relevant. Um, I suspect though most of you have not answered that way. So we're very, very keen indeed to hear the answers, really to guide policy and help inform the debate and make it more meaningful. Um, and if you haven't actually answered the issues yet, don't worry, the poll's gonna be open as the discussion continues. Just go back to menti.com, type in the code and submit your responses as we continue. And the idea is to try and harness as much feedback from around the world as possible to get, frankly, the most democratic, accountable and illuminating answers possibly can. So while you're doing that, or if you've done it already, congratulations, um, we're going to move into the core discussion to help really frame these issues in a practical way. What does accountability really look like? What are the major challenges that we need must overcome to get there? What do we actually need to do? And we have three outstanding panelists to talk about this. We've got El Hodge Al Si, who's the chair of the board of the Kofi Annan Foundation the co-chair of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, former leader of the IFRC. We have Ms. Gabriela Cuevas Baron, who's the president of the Interparliamentary Union. And we have um, Dr. Kwak Teya Hiwain, who is Civil Society Engagement Mechanism, UHC 2030, and Executive Director of the Center <coughs> for Supporting Community Development Initiatives in Vietnam. So voices from around the world, and before I'd like to start, I'd like to start you off by very quickly asking you all to tell us where you're physically speaking from, because these are extraordinary times where everyone is having to essentially improvise, myself included. I'm in a study. Um, and tell us briefly where you're talking from. And can you give us one quick example, very clearly, of how accountability appeared in your life recently or didn't appear, if you like? So let's start with Mr. Asse and then go on to Ms. Cuevas and Dr. Owan. Hello, uh, good afternoon uh, from uh, Geneva where I'm speaking uh, uh, out of a hotel. I was supposed to be in Dakar, Senegal right now, which is my home, but given uh, the restriction, travel restriction due to COVID-19, I still cannot travel, hopefully, I'll be able to do so in the next days to come. Until then, I'm stuck here and connecting uh, live with you, you know, from uh, Geneva. Well, accountability is uh, above all delivering on promises that are made. And that's what will bring trust. That trust will be compliance and then will bring, you know, support. So uh, recently, you know, we've seen uh, in the, uh, uh, Ebola outbreak, you know, in uh, West Africa as well as in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you know, where there was accountability and trust in leadership, we saw good response and good community response. Where it was lacking, we saw those gaps and disparities being exacerbated, and uh, the price of inaction in the past was extremely high for the present. And this is one of the le lessons that we need to learn that to deserve the trust and support of communities, we have to be accountable, and being accountable means to deliver on the promises we make to people. Thank you, Mr. Asai. Ms. Cuevas, where are you talking from? Hello, hello from Mexico City. We are also in kind of lockdown here, not with that uh, very big restrictions, but uh, here we are in the middle of the pandemic. So. 
I, I fully understand all the restrictions that many people are living all around the world. And that also is reflected in, in accountability. For example, just a couple of months ago, two billion people were living in countries where parliaments were restricted or totally suspended. And um, if we try to, to summarize what is accountability, institutionalizing accountability entails having a clarity on knowing both how and why are resources spent and to what extent has then been progress in terms of concrete tangible uh, results. Accountability means that we, in our case as parliamentarians, but that goes to all public offices, we represent the people and we must deliver uh, meaningful, substantive results. Parliaments are the, the very important institution in terms of accountability. First, for ourselves, we need to work together with the people that we represent with our constituencies and explain them how are we using their voice in parliaments to deliver legislation, to allocate budget. But the other way for accountability is working with government. Sometimes accountability is seen like a eternal fight between the parliament and the government. And that is not always that way. Of course, public political debate is important because that's the nature of a parliament. But it also builds the bridge to work together, to have parliaments and governments working into one direction. And I think that we have a lot of examples during this pandemic where governments were uh, held by the, the parliaments. And also we can see a lot of different examples. For example, investing in parliament space off. In Uganda with the IPU's assistance, assistance, the parliament introduced a bill on maternal, newborn and children health. Uh, we can have also some other uh, important practices uh, for good and not that for good. Um, right. right, well, thank you. Um, Dr. Wine. You are speaking, I believe, from Vietnam, but tell me if I'm correct. And of course, Vietnam is, has been part of Asia, which has been at the leading edge of COVID-19. Um, where are you talking from and how is it? Um, yeah, hello everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good afternoon. I'm speaking from a hotel in the central coast of Vietnam. I am actually on holiday with my family. <laughs> so it is, I'm in my hotel room. Um, so we don't have any uh, community transmission of COVID-19 uh, for the last uh, maybe 12 weeks. So we can travel within the country by plane and train and anything. Um, so that that's a situation here that allow us to travel within the country, but still not abroad, yes. Um, as an example of accountability, um, my NGO has been um, doing a COVID-19 uh, uh, relief program to provide food to the homeless people and to the people who are in the most difficult situation who uh, may risk of, um, uh, hunger during the lockdown. Um, and uh, we need to be accountable to uh, reach the people who need uh, the food the most and we also need to be accountable to the people who donate to us because that's um where we get the donation from individuals and groups in the country during the lockdown so that we are able to um, um to do the work that to distribute the food to people um so that is an example of accountability of the the closest example that um i can share uh, about our work Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm sure many of us feel jealous that you've been going on holiday um, wherever we're sitting in the world, because that's not possible in many parts of the world at the moment. But let's turn back to the IAP recommendations. And the first recommendation was for urgent investment in country data systems for national and global security. I'd like to ask, first of all, Mr. Alsai, in your experience of trying to support countries to prevent and respond to humanitarian and conflict situations, how has the data issue played out for you? I mean, have there been moments when you've seen effective examples of how to use data systems or times when you think it's been not so effective? And how does that affect the COVID um, question in relation to women and children's health? 
So, uh, data is extremely important, but um, we often use data in a quite uh, global you know, way. And uh, there must be a disaggregation you know, of that data you know, at the local level, the furthest local level. It must be also a disaggregation alongside you know, gender, you know, age, you know, different vulnerable groups that are facing different risks. The lack of that, you know, will uh, lead us, you know, to, you know, leave people behind. And we hear all these slogans of today, let's walk the last mile, let's make sure that nobody is left behind. But it will not happen, you know, without, you know, good data. There is only, and I rarely use the word only in these kind of settings, a way to truly address in an inclusive manner to the needs of people is to be there where the needs are greatest. And in order to do that, you need really to have the guidance, you know, to have the data. We've seen, for example, that the best use of data has shown us that people with disability are often, uh, often left, you know, behind or totally excluded, totally out of the loop. We have seen also, uh, because of lack of data, we have global approaches that do not take into account the real needs of women and children, while we know for a fact that shocks and hazards in humanitarian situations disproportionately affect you know, women and girls and then children, people with disability. And in some instances, also depending on the data and the profile that we see on our elderly people. So if we take that into account, then we will make sure that, for example, with a good use of data, you know, in uh, humanitarian settings, we make sure that the way that aid is distributed take into account, you know, the need of women and the elderly and disabled people that could not run into the shelters, that could not line up, you know, to take uh, humanitarian supplies. And that data allows us, you know, to uh, bring new innovations such as good trans uh, cash transfer programs, early warning and early alert system and even uh, what is called you know a forecast based financing to respond you know to that a uh, but uh, not a good uh, uh, consideration of data is to uh, for example uh, put like we used to do in the past uh, sanitation facilities uh, without taking into account the particularly need you know of young girls in schools and of course if we do not have a specific uh, sanitation facilities for them, they will not be able to come to school during a menstruation period, for example. And these are extremely important issues, you know, that can only be addressed, you know, when the data is disaggregated. But all that will boil down to, again, the issue of accountability and good governance that we've talked about. We are not all equal uh, in the face, you know, of these challenges, even though we are all affected to make sure then we understand the needs of everybody that is best illustrated by good use of data and the application of accountability through the commitment to respond to that. It is not just you know, to make the case by using data, it is now doing something about the case by acting and committing and justifying like the report is recommended. So with good data, you can basically illuminate inequity, but then you have to obviously then act on it as well, not just illuminate it. And that, of course, brings in the question, as you say, of governance and the role of politicians and parliaments. So I'd like to ask um, Ms. Cuevas, um, in terms of your role as leader of the IPU, um, you know, how do you see this actually playing into the issue of getting more accountability? And what does institutionalizing accountability even mean um, if you actually get the data in the first place? Well, of course, we need to take decisions based on data. We cannot continue with these kind of practices using sometimes beautiful, sometimes awful narratives to build a political speech or a, or a public policy. We need data. We need to have uh, concrete actions on a clear reality. First of all, uh, parliaments are, again, they need to be accountable with our constituencies, with the people that we represent, because that's the most important mandate of a parliament, of a parliamentarian. Second, we need to understand that we have also a 
international responsibility and these international and regional commitments are not well uh, uh, overseen in terms of some parliaments do not ha do not have any powers in terms of, of uh, for example, foreign policy or uh, ratifying these instruments, but they must be engaged because now the problems are getting more and more global and we need also common uh, global solutions. So accountability mechanisms must be adapted and exercised at the national level for parliaments to be uh, able to effectively uh, exercise oversight. Second, we observe that parliaments often lack the capacities and resources to systematically scrutinize the government action. Uh, the, the powers for a, for a parliament for a specialized committee sometimes are not enough to deliver a, prop, a proper research or investigation. Thirdly, oversight remains a political activity. Even so, the political room for maneuver in oversight matters might be limited. This is still true with clear mandates and mechanisms. And I think that, uh, again, parliaments must be working on one side, yes, with the people, on the other side, with the government. But we cannot forget that also parliament needs to be more representative in order to be more accountable. Now, only 24.5 of the total world seats in parliament are for women. That is not representative, that is not inclusive. If we go to youth, people under 30 years old only have 2.2% of the total seats in parliament. And sometimes we believe that if we incorporate, for example, public opinion, that could be enough. And I don't think so. There are some parliaments with very clear mechanisms that are making a very good step forward. For example, Cyprus, they created an, an open parliament where people and the different specialized groups can participate and present proposals. Or for example, Rwanda, they presented with the IPU a sexual and reproductive health bill, uh, bill that they started working with within the parliament as they should, but also at the grassroots levels, at the communities, with other constituencies. And that makes not only an easier process for a bill, but also a more accountable, a more transparent one. And of course, the implementation of this new legislation becomes much easier. Right. Are there any other mechanisms that can actually make Parliament more accountable that we ought to think about, do you think? Yes, and I think that one is the uh, think good sides that we can learn from this pandemic. The use of these technologies, for example, these platforms, uh, more social media. Technology is moving very fast uh, due to the pandemic and we can use it to have more open parliaments and of course more transparent and more accountable one. In this regard, I would like to explain for some institutions, being accountable only means to make public the accounts, the numbers of or the budgets of that institution. But being accountable means not only about budgets, it is about actions, it's about decisions, it's about being fully transparent and fully inclusive. And yes, parliaments have a lot to do, but I am sure that we can incorporate very good practices in terms of open parliament to, uh, through technology and social media. Right, right. Well, thank you. Dr. Wine, as we just heard, COVID-19 has hit vulnerable populations and marginalised populations particularly hard. Given the experience of working with HIV, the crisis there, with um, sex workers, with all the drug users and see, um, women's issues that you've been watching over the recent years, what do you think the real key to making sure that we actually tackle the issue of vulnerability and exclusion are and actually fulfill the long-term goals of UHC? Um, yeah, I think actually, um, first of all, we need to, uh, the, the leader of the world and of the country should just implement the UHC, the Universal Health Coverage Political Declaration because that is the most comprehensive health declaration that emphasizes the principle of leaving no one behind, reaching the furthest behind first. And so the USC political declarations also covers emergency preparedness agenda. It was in September last year, even before COVID-19 pandemic. So if the world just implemented 
we be in quite good place um, also to address the need of the vulnerable and marginalized population, but also to prepare for COVID-19 or any other um, pandemic. Um, but as the country uh, implement the universal health coverage, we would like to ask that um, the USC have to be truly universal in all three dimensions, services, population, and financial protections, because health services, as pointed out in USC definition, should be in a full spectrum from health promotion, prevention, to treatment and rehabilitation, and population dimension should ensure the equity principle that the people left further behind are covered first. And financial protection should ensure that every person, including the people who are most left behind, can afford healthy lifestyle and preventive measure and treatment, etc. Um, this, the, the other thing is that we need sustainable and res uh, resilient systems for health. And by systems here, I mean the system blurs with an S. Um, that should include health system and community systems. Why health system uh, get a lot, of, a lot of attention is it rightly so. Less attention and investment is paid to community system. The truth is that without an inclusive and strong community system, the needs of the people marginalized are not identified their voice are not heard, and they don't have opportunity to contribute. So we do not only film them, but we also miss their life experience. We miss the, uh, their contribution. And the, um, the, the last point I would like to say about to this is about the governance of emergency response, such as a pandemic response, um, a close example is the, the COVID-19 response. The governance of such a responses should include the view of civil society and community. So um, the a CSAM, a civil society engagement mechanism of USC 2030, recently did a survey on the um, civil society and community participation in COVID-19 response. So over organization respond and we found that civil society uh, society respond um in the early uh, in the early stage is largely um independent from the government so it's not coordinated civil society and community are either absent or marginal in community in the country um respond and so right. the the lead parent of community are largely explore and and we don't know who makes the decisions well, um, yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Wine. And that's a lot of great points you've made there. I would love to keep on talking to all of you and get more feedback and comment on what each of you have said. But sadly, very sadly, we are almost out of time and we're going to have to move on to the next section of the discussion. So apologies for not having a chance to have more interactive discussion. But these are very thought provoking comments. And those of you who are just joining right now anywhere in the world, um, do go back and have a look at the discussion that's happened so far and do also take note of the fact that as part of the drive to get more community engagement, there is a survey going on as this event takes place, which you can actually find under menti.com. That's the web page um, with the code 909486 and submit your responses. And it would be very good to get as many of you as possible for filling in that survey simply to provide a sense of what the community thinks is actually happening at the moment to inform better leadership and better policy making. But before we finish the survey and to really take us into the second half of this discussion, I'd like to introduce Natalia Kanen, who's a host of the Every Woman, Every Child Secretariat to offer her views on today's discussion. Thank you so much, Gillian. Excellencies, dear friends, it's an honor to represent the Secretary General on this very important occasion. Under his leadership, EWEC is a standard bearer for all that we strive for as a human family, dignity and hope, progress and prosperity and peace. Together, we stand for investing in healthy and empowered women, 
children and adolescents who can bring about the change needed to create a better future for all. UN reform is built upon enhancing flexibility, transparency, and accountability at all levels to unlock the resources, to develop the innovative solutions, and to drive the ambitious change needed in this decade of action. Even before the emergence of COVID-19, for millions of women and adolescents, high quality healthcare was unavailable. It was inaccessible or it was unaffordable. And now the pandemic threatens our common efforts to achieve universal access to sexual and reproductive health in line with the 2030 agenda. As we respond to this new reality and build back better, upholding sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights is essential. Yes, women, adolescents, and children are at greatest risk at being left behind. And how do we know who they are and where they are? With data, data, disaggregated data to support better understanding and planning to advise us and how we prioritize. Governments, development partners, civil society, and private sector stakeholders all need reliable evidence. And that clock is ticking. To reimagine health systems post COVID-19, we need sustainable people-centric solutions. Universal health coverage points the way. And we look forward to EWEC's continuing leadership and thank the IAP panel for this very important, insightful report. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Kanem. And once again, those are very rousing words. So we've had the report, we've had a series of very sobering, quite depressing statistics. We've had a series of rousing calls to arms and essentially priorities highlighted very clearly about what needs to be done. So what can be done to actually turn this talk into action and make sure some of this actually happens with concrete actions? We're going to hear from a series of speakers now, each of whom will give their sense of what needs to tangibly happen next. Um, we're going to start with His Excellency, Mr. Kaha Imadze, who's going to be talking to us as the permanent representative of Georgia to the United Nations. Welcome, Ambassador. To co-host this event together with Japan and South Africa, firstly, as a country that figures in the report as one of the five case studies, and secondly, as a country that is also a co-chair together with Japan and Thailand of the UN Group of Friends of Universal Health Coverage. I'm a proponent of uh, universal health coverage, uh, no doubt about that, as a co-facilitator of that process, thanks to Maria Fernanda, who will who will figure later. And we all can take pride of the fact that the political declaration happened and it's a landmark achievement. But now, obviously, it's time for action and for the countries themselves to decide in what kind of societies would like to live. Want to live in the societies of individuals, offering a lot of freedom of action and tremendous incentives for individual success and prosperity, of course, within uh, the rule of law, or the societies that offer all of the above, uh, but are less individual focused and try to leave no one behind and try to share and give. And UHC is really at the very heart of it. Now, as for this report, the findings are very interesting and timely, and clearly the accountability is uh, the key. But the only mechanism that we have is the VNR. And VNR has its limitations given the voluntary uh, nation of it. I'm facilitating this year the HOPF and ECOSOC review process, and I do know what are the limitations. And institutionalizing um, accountability is essential, but doing it globally is very difficult because of different national uh, understanding. But institutionalizing accountability on a national level is really possible, and it should be driven not only from top to bottom or from government down, but also from bottom to top. In other words, it has to be a public demand. Now, how do we embed this in public culture? Through education, through evidence-based information and through positive examples showing the real benefits of it. Now, as for the Georgia's case study, well, firstly, thank you for highlighting some positive aspects of uh, UHC. Um, regionalization of perinatal services is one of those and highlighting also the challenges that the country has. Um, accountability, uh, quality assurance, sustainability, those are all there and these recommendations are now being studied by the health ministry. Uh, health has been the top priority for the country and we introduced this in uh, UHC in um, 
12, 13, uh, together with 23 other disease-related uh, programs. And lastly, from my personal capacity. Now, let me reiterate that given the setback that the world is suffering because of COVID-19, to build back better, and while question, not questioning the holistic nature of SDGs, investment in health and education are the two key areas. When I talk health, I mean both the short-term emergency response as well as long-term um, strategic uh, investment and planning. And when I talk about education, I first and foremost uh, mean teaching and building critical thinking in uh, children and youth and adolescents. I guess I exceeded my two minutes, so apologies for that, and back to you, Gillian. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ambassador, and those were rousing words. And it's very interesting, as a journalist, having tracked the development of the discussion this year, to see how the phrase, build back better, is spreading very quickly. It's something that we write quite a lot about on the Financial Times' Moral Money platform that covers the Sustainable Development Goals, and I would predict that the build back better tag is going to be increasingly heard later this year. But we're now going to hear from Ms. Maria Fernandez Espinosa, who's speaking to us on behalf of the UHC, Universal Healthcare Movement Political Advisory Panel of the UHC 2030, and as president of the um, 73rd Assembly session of the UN General Assembly. Sorry, I mangled my words there. But anyway, um, Ms. Espinosa. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. What a great way of starting the high-level political forum this year. First of all, uh, allow me to introduce the Universal Health Coverage Movement Political Advisory Panel, which Asai and Gabriela Cuevas and myself have the privilege to serve as members. This uh, newly established uh, panel aims to provide guidance to UHC 2030 in order to boost political support for UHC and convey a consolidated message to high-level political leaders for ensuring that their commitments made in the UN high-level political meeting last year translate into concrete action at the national and local levels. UHC 2030 welcomes all recommendations of uh, the IAP. Uh, all recommendations are relevant, are feasible, and are timely. By uh, day December 12, 2020, which is UHC Day, we will deliver our new initiative on the state of UHC commitments. Uh, they will provide a multi-stakeholder view on progress made on UHC for all, including women, children, adolescents, and other marginalized and vulnerable groups. In 2020, the review will set a baseline on commitments and identify gaps, and will also focus on how the world has coped with the ravaging effects of COVID-19 in our health systems. And we have heard a lot of staggering evidence of that. So I have the pleasure today to launch something very uh, innovative, the multi-stakeholder survey, which aims to gather the stories and real perceptions of UHC, particularly from non-governmental actors. It is not enough to look at the policies and statements by political leaders. We want to hear people's voices to better understand ground realities and assess progress on UHC, as well as, of course, to identify challenges as felt by real people on the ground. UHC 2030 also launched the UHC data portal. Data was mentioned by Natalia Kanem before and the, this data portal, which provides a single interface to access selected UHC data from SDG statistics and UHC 2030 partners. So more country data and advanced portal functions will be available around UHC Day, which means December 2020. So we will support institutional efforts of social political accountability to ensure political leaders take informed decisions and comply with their commitments. Civil society, academia, parliamentarians, the private sector and media are invited to use our resources and information to support accountability processes in their own countries. So we um, invite you to participate, to engage, to contribute, responding to the survey I just mentioned. We invite you to be an active member of the universal health coverage movement. So health is indeed a political choice. 
let's move together towards good, good health and well-being for all, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Back to you. Thank you very much indeed. And we look forward to seeing both the results of the survey and hope that people take part in that, but also in the UHC Day, which will have particular significance this year. Now, I'd like to turn next to Ms. Evelyn Carrillo, who is the Project Director of Youth in Action of the AMREF Health Africa, to tell us about the importance of getting youth voices involved in this movement as well, because we've heard a lot about how COVID-19 is going to hit women and children, but there won't be meaningful change in the long term unless youth also get involved. So, Ms. Carrillo, tell us what your thoughts are on this issue. Thank you. This is an important conversation because it comes at a pivotal moment when you're dealing with the global health crisis of COVID-19. I believe that for us to effectively achieve the commitments in the IAP report, for us to effectively address this pandemic and achieve the 2030 agenda, we need a paradigm shift where decision making includes youth voices and the voices of women, children and adolescents. I have seen firsthand the change that can be realized when youth are at the fore of decision making. I have seen youth effectively advocating for resource allocation to use friendly services. I have seen youth effectively advocating for health benefits packages that address the priorities and needs of young people. And of course, at global level, the power of, of youth movements who collectively contributed to the UHC 2030 key asks and gave out a powerful call to action for meaningful youth engagement and for everyone to move together to achieve the UHC 2030 agenda. It is important, therefore, for countries to invest in civic spaces to ensure that youth are at the fore of decision making. Countries should also invest in adolescents and youth because this yields a tenfold economic benefit and it also ensures that young people benefit not just in their youth but in the adulthood and future generations. With regards to the IAP recommendations, recommendation number three on ensuring that voices of everyone are heard and accountability resonates very well with the youth. One of the actions that we will take forward is to foster youth-led social accountability platforms. We will also invest in in-person and digital platforms that enable youth to have a collective voice and to spur collective movements of young people at this time when everyone needs it the most. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carrillo. And I should congratulate you on having by far and away the most interesting background to talk against, which puts the rest of us older people to shame. Um, now I'm told that we have an intervention, a last minute intervention from Mr. Peter McDougall, who is the Assistant Deputy Minister of Global Issues and Development of Global Affairs in Canada. Mr. McDougall, you're clearly with us. Um, do you have something you'd like to jump in and add to the conversation? Yes, uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning everyone and thank you to the IAP for your excellent work. This is how they are to and that the IEP recommendations can and will have an impact at the community and country level. Accountability is a critical feature of successful governance at every level, whether NGOs, member states, or international organizations and platforms. Accountability is especially important now. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic will exacerbate inequalities and reverse development gains, in particular, for women and children who already experience poverty, exclusion, and marginalization more acutely. When it comes to evidence and data, we are hearing directly from partners how the pandemic is making the collection and analysis of disaggregated health data even more difficult. This will be a, a central challenge for all of us and one that will require innovation and a collective effort from all partners. By strengthening accountability, we can help ensure that no one is left behind in the continued push towards the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. And we've had a long list of very thought-provoking speakers. We've had a series of very clear-cut initiatives which um, and calls to arms. Um, in terms of what needs to be done to tackle the issue. We still have a few more speakers who want to make their comments and we're very grateful to have them. So I'd like to turn to Dr. Tedros Adnanam 
Gabe Reyes, who's the Director General of the WHO, the Chair of the HA Partnership. Um, Dr. Tedros, um, do please share your thoughts about what needs to be done next. Your Excellencies, uh, friends and colleagues, at the esteemed speakers before me have underscored accountability is a powerful force. It can drive transformative change, especially for those left the farthest behind. We know that vulnerable populations are at the greatest risk of hardship due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Its health, socioeconomic effects could reverse decades of progress on women's, children's and adolescents' health and rights. But accountability connects commitments to progress, and that's why this report offers us hope. If enacted in an accountable way, global commitments made on universal health coverage, primary health care, international health regulations will lead to real benefits. These were critical priorities before COVID-19 and are even more important now. Recognizing that accountability requires a whole of government and whole of society approach, we must strive for inclusive multi-sectoral engagement. And crucially, we must listen to the people we serve and to whom we are accountable. By working in solidarity, we can deploy accountability in health to transform com commitments into progress and make a real difference to the most vulnerable and marginalized in our world. Thank you to the IAP for its valuable report. My H6 colleagues and I look forward to working with all of you to put its recommendations into practice. Dr. Tedros. And lastly, I'd like to introduce the Right Honourable Helen Clark, who, of course, is a former Prime Minister of New Zealand and the board chair of the PMNCH. Dr. Clark, sorry, Right Honourable Helen Clark. On behalf of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, thank you to the Independent Accountability Panel for its report. PMNCH commits to doing everything in its power to implement the report's recommendations. On accountability, PMNCH does support national multi-stakeholder dialogue platforms, which encourage strong accountability mechanisms. We work alongside the Interparliamentary Union and others to support parliamentarians to hold governments accountable. And we support coalition building to enhance social accountability and to communicate our messages through global media, including social media. PMNCH has agreed on a seven point global call to action on ensuring women's, children's and adolescents health services during the pandemic and beyond. That supports the IAP's recommendations by encouraging political commitment and resource mobilization. But as the IAP report shows, our collective efforts on accountability have to step up. So PMNCH calls on all multi-stakeholder partnerships to join forces to work on the urgent measures identified by the report. The COVID-19 pandemic has made this work more important than ever. Progress towards the SDG targets on saving the lives of women and children was already lagging by some 20% and now is faltering further. High quality data must play a vital role in identifying where there's a need for course correction. Data acts like a spotlight. It identifies where change needs to happen and it reveals where injustice is the most profound. But of course, data alone aren't enough. We must also invest in social accountability. That is part of the PMNCH call to action and it's a pillar of the IAP's accountability framework. We must hear directly from women, children and adolescents and be able to understand their experiences. We must know where babies are being born and into what conditions, how and where women are dying in pregnancy and childbirth, how and where discrimination is being experienced 
and where poor health care is failing people, and what can be done to overcome all these challenges. PMNCH is on the steering committee for the What Women Want campaign convened by the White Ribbon Alliance. Since early 2018, that campaign has heard from more than a million women around the world, and they are telling us that what they want most is respectful and dignified care. That invaluable insight might not have come to light had there not been a preparedness to actually ask and to listen. There is progress being made on gathering and analysing data. There is progress on social accountability, but there must be more. Now our sector must work hard together to implement the IAP's recommendations on accountability. That is so vital for the health and well-being of women, children and adolescents around our world. Thank you very much indeed, Helen Clark, and thank you to all the speakers who have spoken earlier. We've heard a series of very strong calls to arms on the back of some of the very depressing statistics that we heard right at the beginning that are in the report. And we've had a whole series of commitments about what needs to be done next. And speaking as someone who's a journalist, whose job is to really track and try and shape the public discourse, writing from the West, from New York and London. It seems to me that this year, we've really gone through at least three distinct stages in how healthcare issues and COVID and the themes of this report are discussed globally. In the first stage, there was shock when COVID-19 hit and people even in the richest parts of the West were suddenly reminded of something they often ignore, which is we do link, live in a deeply interlinked planet. We are linked in a chain of humanity and pandemics show that if one part of that chain breaks, we all suffer. Pandemics don't respect walls or borders usually, and they essentially make us realize that we need to think about the health of the planet as a whole, or it creates risk for everyone. And in the first stage of the crisis, there was a lot of discussion about COVID-19 being a great equalizer. But then, as I said earlier, we discovered that in some ways, that was tragic nonsense because we've seen in countries like America and much of Europe that actually it's been invariably the poorest, the most marginalized, most excluded who have suffered worse from COVID by essentially getting sicker more than others and who are also carrying the heavier burden of the economic shocks. But in many ways, that's just a small sign of what's happening across the world in terms of what COVID-19 threatens to do to healthcare systems with women and children. And that's very depressing. But as we realize that this really is potentially a healthcare crisis in some of the most vulnerable parts of the world, there could also be an opportunity because it's a lesson from history that whenever you have a dramatic shock, you often also have the one thing that's going to force people to work together and get serious about fixing underlying problems. And COVID-19 has indeed exposed many problems that were there in the world before. The phrase Build Back Better initially emanated actually after World War II, when much of Europe was in rubble. And there was a real commitment to trying to build back better, both lit literally and in physical architectural form, but also in terms of the social systems that were created after World War II. And you have to hope that the shock of COVID-19 and this slew of very depressing statistics we've heard will actually concentrate minds and force governments to action. And you also have to hope that the extraordinary advances of data science, which are now underway, could actually support that because issues like accountability and transparency are going to be absolutely critical in terms of gathering the data and using the data to galvanize action. But the danger of course is that COVID-19 has also undermined resources to tackle these problems and it's also in a sense acted as a great distraction in many ways. The governments may end up looking inwards and worrying about their own populations that rather than realizing the global nature of what we now face. One other thing that does give me hope though, is that as a journalist, as someone at the Financial Times trying to steal global conversation, 
and also as founder of the Moral Money platform, which is trying to focus on the sustainable development goals and sustainability issues, what I do see is that young people around the world, businesses around the world, the financial sector around the world is increasingly interested in working with governments and NGOs and philanthropic groups to try and tackle some of these issues. So we've had some very bad news in this report, but we also have potentially good news in the sense that it will concentrate minds, or I hope so. So I'd just like to say thank you to all of you who have contributed to the report, which we'll be tracking at Financial Times. Thank you to all of you who have spoken today. Thank you to all of you who filled in the survey and very best of luck in tackling these very, very serious issues. Thank you.